morning. Needless to say, I'm a little uh, nervous, so uh, bear with me. I'd like to start by, uh, well, first of all, my name is Nick Bowdy. Uh, my colleague Robert Ronk is sitting with us today. He's going to be uh, up here afterwards for the question and answer session, and then we're going to be demonstrating on our 1930 tabletop printing press, which, yes, it is a machine. Uh, we call them that all the time, uh, but it is a printing press. Um, I'd like to start by just thanking Ben and the Creative Mornings for having us here today. I recognize a lot of your faces out there. I know I've worked with a lot of people, see you around town, and uh, I just want to say that I'm honored and humbled by uh, being here in front of you today. I hope to see a good chunk of you up here uh, at future months talking. Um, a lot of creative people in this town. I look forward to it. So today's uh, topic of ink makes a lot of sense to me to have invited two printmakers up here to talk. Uh, we typically go home with stained fingers, and uh, I don't think I have too many clothes that aren't uh, covered with ink. Uh, today, this is my nice shirt. So there's only a couple of stains. Um, but before I can really get started to talking about what Hound Dog Press does, um, I'd like to give you guys uh, a little bit of a history here. So we're going to go back to the year 1440. We're going to start with Johann Gutenberg. He was a German metalsmith, and he invented reusable, movable type. He did not invent the printing press or the printing process. That had been happening for centuries. Uh, Eastern societies have been printing far longer than any Europeans, uh, but, you know, if you know any Germans, they claim to have entered the world. So uh, we're going to give Gutenberg the credit here today. But his invention in 1440 was handset, movable, reusable type. I said that again because that is important. Um, that means that you set one letter at a time, upside down and backwards, line by line, page by page, to create the text. So with this type, of course, Gutenberg set, uh, let's see, there we go. Of course, the Bible, right? So this was the first letterpress printed book in history. When you bought a Bible, as usually the church, uh, you would just bought a loose stack of paper. It was a loose leaf stack of sheets. It was up to you to do the binding and the illustration to illuminate them. You've seen the illuminated text, right? So each Bible that was sent out was eventually uh, uh, customized, I guess you could say. But in 1440, uh, this was crazy technology for people. It seems silly for us today because, you know, if our phones don't get smaller next year, we're all going to, like, riot, you know? <laughs> but in 1440, this was crazy. It scared people. It was actually considered a black art, a dark art. So when we talk about things in the printing process, um, we, talk, we give it very interesting terms. Um, the lever that you see coming off of the press isn't exactly the right press for the time period, but something like that that creates the printing action was referred to as the devil's tail. You know, an intern would have been the devil's apprentice. You know, so these are, these are just scary times. Um, and prior to this, all books pretty much were handwritten by monks or scribes, and they would take uh, almost an entire generation to complete a text. Uh, the books that had been printed before Gutenberg were hand-carved blocks, so it, a very laborious, time-consuming process. Uh, so needless to say, there were very few books printed. Um, it took Gutenberg five years to print an estimated 190 copies of the Bible. That's a long time, right? I'm sure if you just hit print on your printers at home, and as long as you replace the ink and the paper, you'd probably get five, uh, 190 copies done in just a couple of months. But again, he was hand-setting type, letter by letter, line by line, printing one sheet at a time off of, ooh, we jumped ahead, off of an old wooden press. He didn't invent this press, but he did convert a wine-making press used for crushing grapes. Uh, so it is true, since the beginning of printing history, printers have been alcoholics. Uh, so you printed one sheet at a time with this uh, giant machine, and it was a, a huge wooden press, 10 foot by 10 foot, uh, built out of large timbers. There was a screw in the middle there that required a very strong man to turn in one direction to lower the platen and create the impression, and then to turn the opposite direction to raise the platen back up. Um, so it, again, it was, it was quicker than handwriting everything, but it was uh, not a fast process. To go back uh, to his 
invention, the handset movable type. In 1440, we refer to this as a humanistic period. So we call this a body of type. In our shop, these aren't fonts. Those are on your computer. That is something different in our world. This is a body of type. So we give it human attributes. It has a type face, right? It has shoulders and a beard. It stands on its feet. So these are all terms within our process. Uh, an important part on this piece of text, or uh, the body of type that you see, is what's called a nick running across the base of that type. When we set our letters upside down and backwards, we need to see our nicks. And as long as they're all lining up, we know that we have the proper typeface, which seems maybe a little silly to even need to worry about that. But if you come into our shop, I will show you some six-point type. And you're talking about a typeface that I can barely see without magnifying glasses. Uh, so the difference between a Garamond or a Gaudi, I don't know, you know. But uh, those nicks will be in different locations for each font. And it's a little bit of a tell. When Gutenberg was setting type, you composed type at a composing station. Uh, you would stand at a, uh, a case like this, and you notice that there are two different shelves. There are some type cases up on our upper case, and there are type cases on a lower case. Anyone care to guess which letters I might have kept in my upper case? <laughs> so we do call them that today, uh, upper and lower case, because of just simply where they were stored. In the 19th century, though, we combine those into one single case. So, let me go back a second and, and explain the difference between the fonts and the typefaces. On our computers today, there's drop-down menus. You know, you click your fonts and you scroll down. You can download thousands of fonts. You can continually change them. Endless possibilities. But when you're talking about physical metal, metal type, it is one point size, one typeface, right? So each drawer that if you wanted six point through 48 point, you needed a drawer or in Gutenberg's time, two cases per typeface. So this is very cumbersome would have taken a lot of text to really uh, offer a wide variety of, of selection there. In the 19th century, the solution was to combine them into one single case, and we refer to that as the California job case. They are made out of England. The wood was coming from California. That's just where they got the term. Um, but you can see our, our layout of our type. The lowercase letters are off to the left, and they're set in accordance to use. So think about how many E's we use in our vocabulary, a lot. So the E is the largest box. Uh, think of the words you can spell, the, on, our, or, is, things like that, very centralized, much like our keyboards on our computers, the faster you type, the faster you get done. The faster we set our type, the more we get paid. The X, the Z, the Qs, those are off to the side because we're not using those as often. The uppercase letters are just set in alphabetical order with the exception of two letters. Anyone see what's out of place? The J and the U, any idea why? Speak up. Mm, that's a good guess. Yeah? And you're on the right track, but they did not exist in the year 1440. The J was not added to our alphabet until the uh, early uh, 16th century, and the U wasn't widely accepted until the early 17th century. So when the J and the U were added to the alphabet and put into their proper place, it knocked each box back one, therefore slowing the compositors down, therefore making less money. The solution was to simply put them at the end of the line there, uh, and it's been that way ever since. So we talk about, I, I just ran through Gutenberg in 1440. There's a lot more information. But uh, from 1440 up until our most famous American printer, Benjamin Franklin, very little changed. We're still using wooden presses. By the time we get to Benjamin Franklin's time, it is referred to as a common press. Um, he is still handsetting type from two cases. Uh, and still printing one sheet at a time uh, with dampened paper, and his inks were typically lamp black and linseed oil. You cleaned with kerosene, and you soaked your inking balls in goat's urine. So I can't imagine what a shop must have smelled like uh, during these periods. But uh, Benjamin Franklin, while he was so many things, he was very proud of his printing uh, roots. If we jump all the way up to the 19th century, and right here is, this is our press in our shop. This is a 1916 Golding Jobber. From Benjamin Franklin up into the 19th century, again, very little changed. But once we had the Industrial Revolution, things really sped up. We began casting iron, making these presses lighter. But still, this is an 800-pound press. It's not like we can move this very quickly. But we're not, now we're getting away from these giant timbers. Uh, things began to speed up a little bit became mechanized. Uh, on the press there, it's uh, hard to explain, but you see sort of this rubber roller going across the uh, platen there. 
but prior to the invention of rubber, Mr. Gutenberg, uh, Goodyear invented vulcanized rubber in the uh, early part of the 19th century. Uh, we had those leather inking balls uh, I mentioned a moment ago, and you would have to rock the ink onto the text, which took a long time. Once we had these rubber rollers, or brayers, you guys, you know, are all played with those in school, and they were combined onto the printing press, uh, it really sped up the process quite a bit. So now as the machine is opening and closing, and I would definitely invite you all to come up and see our little tabletop because it has all of these parts and mechanisms, you will see that it's doing the inking action and the printing action all at the same time versus a, you know, a much slower uh, way of doing things like the common presses. Um, so I, I breezed over a lot of things here, but with the 20 minutes, I got to make this short. Uh, so you go from Gutenberg through Benjamin Franklin, we can talk about Walt Whitman and William Morris and all these just famous influential artists and writers and poets. Um, the Wright brothers, the inventors, you know, I mean, a lot of people were printers back then. It was a very popular trade. And so with this beautiful equipment and this long history of printing, you might ask yourself, well, where did we take it in 2008? We made a card with the word poop on it. Uh, because we're really classy and mature, um, we couldn't think of anything better to write, but you know, we, we, ha we have fun at this point. We took it a little further. Um, Robert and I take what we do very, very seriously. We like to produce the highest quality of product that we possibly can send out of the shop. Uh, but then we have a good time because we have all this stuff at our fingertips, like why not have fun and make some immature cards, you know? Whoop. This thing's finicky, or my fingers are just shaking that bad. There we go. Uh, I want to stop for just a moment before we go on uh, with Hound Dog Press and just give you a brief history of where Robert and I come from. Um, the uh, attractive sailor in the foreground is one of our uh, Printmaking professors from the University of Kentucky, uh, Jerry Firstman, uh, quite a character. If anyone went to UK, you know this guy, you know he's funny. Um, but I'd like to talk about the man behind him, Ross Zirkel. Uh, he was really our mentor. He took us under his wing, uh, showed us letterpress, or not, I'm sorry, he in introduced us to printmaking, uh, really built our passion for the process. Uh, we lost Ross in 2005, and um, I, you know I, I don't think a day goes by where I don't think of him. I'm sure Robert could say the same. We wouldn't be here today without the guy. Um, but Robert and I met as printmaking majors at the University of Kentucky. We graduated with BFAs, so with a focus in printmaking. Uh, in 2000, I graduated a year before Robert. In 2003, my wife and I moved to New York. I uh, worked in a couple of letter press shops up there. Uh, for two years, I spent working in a museum recreating 19th century letterpress. During that time, Robert graduated and began and continued working as an artist in Lexington, but he came to visit me one weekend, and uh, instead of going out and seeing the sights, we just sat in the museum shop and printed and handset type all day long, you know? Uh, and of course, conversations were had that day uh, that led us to this point, um, so we kind of very quickly thought that we could work well together and this was to be something we could do. And we knew the time would come that I'd be moving back to Kentucky and Louisville was a, you know, a simple choice. My wife grew up here, so for most of you, I'm, you know, if I meet a lot of people that moved to Louisville for love and uh, it seems to be a consistent theme. Uh, but Robert followed uh, to Lexington shortly after. It took a couple of years after 2006, seven, uh, we started acquiring equipment, we started collecting things and working out the kinks uh, and in 2008, we opened our doors at the Melwood Art Center, just uh, down the road here. We shared a very small studio with our good friend and glass artist, Johnny Gordon, who's with us here today. He, uh, I don't know if he knew what he was getting into when we moved all of our heavy shit in there, but um, it was interesting. Uh, we quickly grew out of that space. We weren't sure how to, uh, you know, we weren't sure how Louisville was going to perceive us or receive us. Um, it was a tough first year. Robert slept on a cot in the back of the shop. Uh, so we did this with, uh, it was all out of pocket, we have no debt in our business, we took out no loans to do this, so we lived very simply. Uh, my wife was very patient and understanding for those first years as well. Um, but finally we uh, knew we were onto something and in 2000 and, uh, what was that, 9, 10, we moved into our Market Street location where we still currently are. Uh, it's a great shop, we love it, uh, it fits our aesthetics just the way we liked it. Um, 
it was a good move for us. We, within six months, though, we, we realized we actually did not rent enough space. Uh, so we've been living uh, on top of boxes for five years. Um, but it's good. We're uh, going to be moving here shortly uh, to our next and third spot. But during the time at Market Street, we really started to grow exponentially. Um, again, just the positive reception we got from Louisville was, was amazing, and it was just it blew us away. Uh, in the first two or three years at, on Market Street, we went through almost 20 interns. Uh, so training people every three months got a little old. We finally bit the bullet and hired one of our interns. Uh, Lara's with us here today. She stayed a short few months with us and then moved on, but then we hired her uh, co-intern, Maggie, who is still with us now for almost over two years or something like that. So Maggie's running our 1916 uh, Golding Jobber. Uh, then about a year ago, we hired our second employee, Joanne. There she is running our 1940 Chandler and Price. So here's the next step. This is Barrett Avenue. We'll be moving next month in April. Um, it was a big decision to hire a couple of people. Uh, if any of you are small business owners, you would understand. Uh, it's a lot of investment, and uh, it's, hard to, it's a hard pill to swallow right away. But very quickly, Laura and then Maggie and now Joanne um, quickly earned their keep, and we found that we're able to produce far more work now with the extra hands, and they are easily and more than enough paying for themselves. Um, sadly, I'll admit I don't print much anymore. I find myself on the computer most days, uh, so I have to find excuses to get in their business and get my fingers dirty too. I'm sure they'd appreciate it if I just stuck to the computer. But uh, <clears throat> we grew pretty quickly and we do a lot of production. We get a lot of work out our doors. Um, we probably average one to two jobs maybe a day. Um, so it's a very busy, hectic work schedule. Barrett's going to be a new chapter for us, I hope. Uh, I'm afraid it may not be enough room already, even before we've moved in, but it'll be good. Uh, we'll be happy. We're bringing on some new presses, an older press, uh, more of a common style press, a Washington press from the 1890s. We're going to be teaching with, we're going to be demonstrating on that, and, a couple, and one more automated press that hopefully will speed up production that does a little bit of the hand feeding and printing for us. Because uh, as of right now, we're hand feeding each sheet, one sheet at a time, printing one color at a time. So when I say we knock out one to two jobs a day, I, that's not just like hitting a button. I mean, you're, we're there from eight until five, you know, full on production. And the production's what got us to where we are. So we do a lot of wedding invitations, business cards, stationery. That's the bread and butter for us. Uh, we are able to accommodate <clears throat> modern designs. Uh, this beautiful image to the right there is done by Rich from Forest Giant. We do their calendars every year that they send out to their clients. So we're really happy to work with a lot of you designers here in town. We're not just limited to handset movable type. Uh, we do the, use that for all of our product because we feel that that's important. Uh, but when it comes to custom work, we're able to take your digital files and convert them to polymer plates, which is a photo engraved process that was invented uh, early in the 19th century along with photography. So we're exposing light through a negative onto a piece of plastic where it hardens, wash that away, and what you're left with is a raised plate. Those then get mounted onto a base, and then we lock them up into our press. And so we're able to print those alongside of our handset type and our hand-carved blocks as well. Um, we print on a really nice, soft paper these days, so it takes the impression very well. We're hitting it hard, which in the 19th century, uh, well, even early 20th century, is considered bad printing. Uh, you didn't want to feel the text because you would have, that would have meant you're hitting your type too hard, and it's lead, and it's going to be crushed, and it's too soft for that. The polymer allows us to really give it a deep impression so that when someone hands you a $2 business card, <laughs> it's going to hopefully like stop them for a minute and start a conversation is the hope, I guess. Um, I'll admit we are expensive, and I jokingly say that we can't afford ourselves. Um, and it's not for everyone. You know, Vista Prints out there, you can get 1,000 business cards for 20 bucks, and by all means do that. But depending on who you are and the business you're in, we all know that you know, separating yourself from the masses is very important. Uh, and that's sort of what we're pushing on you here. Uh, I've done a few books as well. This was uh, designed and printed uh, from beginning to end and bound by Robert. Um, mostly it's polymer plate, uh, but he hand drew the cover. And it's really difficult to photograph books. So you're not seeing this whole thing, but this is a beautiful accordion book that folds out uh, and opens and it came with a sleeve and everything. So we not only work with uh, just brides uh, or anything like that, but we're working with poets and authors. And so we are producing, uh, starting to um, produce some books. 
So really, these are probably some things you guys may recognize at this point. Uh, alongside of our custom work, this is where we have our fun. We produce a line of greeting cards, probably well over 100 designs at this point uh, for all seasons and all uh, reasons. Uh, so here's just a shot of our card racks in the shop. We're fortunate enough to sell all over town at this point. I'm sure you guys have seen us in Y Louisville and I don't know. I, I'm not even going to begin to mention them all, Carmichael's, Regala, whatever. There's a good number of them in Louisville here. And then we're carried throughout the state of Kentucky at this point as well. The next step for us is trying to expand outside of Kentucky. Um, some notable designs that everyone seems to love. Um, this is definitely our most popular. And you definitely can't spell Louisville without love. Uh, this card was inspired from my time in, <laughs> my time in New York. Uh, I was really sick of answering those four questions. <laughs> Yay, more Kentucky pride. Uh, hand carved linoleum block by Robert. So when it comes to our cards, again, we're hand setting the type and we're hand carving the blocks just for that aesthetic. Uh, along with about 40 local businesses this year, we joined FIBA, the Fair Events Vendor Association. So we're really happy to uh, be participating in many different walks of uh, groups of people throughout Louisville. So the reason we are here today is because that, uh, or doing what we do today, not here physically in the space, but uh, Robert and I, we're printmakers, so we are artists at heart. Um, Production pays the bills, it keeps the lights on, um, and our belly's full, but it, our passions lie with the linoleum blocks and, and printmaking. So for a lot of these event posters you guys have seen hanging around town, Robert and I have actually hand carved these blocks um, and printed directly from the block. We'll hand draw everything first, we'll go into the computer to hand set some, or to set type and manipulate things, but then from there it's all done by hand from that point. Um, again, it's more of aesthetic. We feel that uh, you could cheat on the computer and add some of that noise and the distraction, but uh, the natural imperfections that come with these linoleum blocks is really what gives us our kicks, you know. Um, so a lot of the work is commission-based today. Um, I wish we could make more prints on our own, but we, we do find ourselves pretty busy. But we work with great people. Uh, Ralph Stanley on that poster was pretty awesome, I think. Robert designed and printed that. The poster on the right with the sugar skull was commissioned by a, uh, a uh, nonprofit, and it fits in with today's theme uh, of education. They commissioned me to print these, to make these posters for them. They go and sell them to raise money to buy art supplies for an indigenous village in Mexico. So it's all giving back to the community. Uh, we are proud to give back whenever we can. We offer a lot of children, uh, kids workshops and classes. We have uh, one to two classes in probably a month uh, at a minimum, uh, giving free tours to all different levels of, of kids. And then we travel around with this little printing press and we teach classes and let kids hand carve blocks and print Valentine's cards or Christmas cards. Some of you here may have taken them because we do it for adults as well. It's not just for kids. Um, from time to time, we do have the, uh, the, the ability to make art just for ourselves. Uh, we were invited to participate in a group show at the Kentucky Derby Museum a couple years ago. Uh, this was a piece Robert came up with. So this is a hand-carved linoleum block. Uh, one, two, three, oh, four colors maybe. So when we print all of these colors, I mean, when I said that before, we print one color at a time. This poster went through the press that many times, and all of the colors come from one single block. It's a reduction process. You have to think about what you're doing. You start with your lightest color. The whole thing gets printed in that color. You reduce the block down for your next run, and you move on to your darker colors. In the end, the final color being the darkest uh, blue there, that's all that's left of the block. So it's a limited edition run. We can't go back and reproduce these. Uh, a recent piece I just did uh, during all that beautiful, wonderful snow we had a couple weeks ago, uh, I was sled riding late night uh, with some beer, and I, land on my, I fell on my back a couple of times. Uh, just laying there, I was inspired by the beautiful night sky, so we went, I went back home and this week, then came in over the weekend and made this print. I uh, had a lot of fun doing it. But you can see the blocks are there, so this particular print was not a reduction. It was just printed with those three different uh, linoleum blocks there. Another Kentucky Proud piece, Robert carved, uh, linoleum again. Uh, so just a shot of stuff hanging in the store. I mean, I didn't want to go through a whole slide presentation because I didn't want to bore you all. Uh, but essentially, everything that you see is hand carved linoleum or hand set type. And I'm sure you may recognize some of the posters for events around town. We're fortunate enough to have our pieces hung in windows up and down Bargetown, 
Frankfurt Avenue, Nulu, you know. Um, so fortunately for us, if we make things beautiful, you know, pretty enough, they do get hung up in uh, public areas and it's essentially free advertisement for us. I uh, recommend that to any starting artist, you know. You gotta do some free stuff out there, um, you know, for a while. Well, really that brings us back full circle to ink. I don't know if I'm under 20 minutes or over 20 minutes, but I just wanna you know, end by thanking you all for listening to me today and putting up with us. Um, I would encourage all of you uh, who want to learn more about what we do to come find us at the shop. We'll be on Market Street for only a few more weeks. We'll be moving to Barrett definitely by May uh, and hopefully uh, settled soon after that. It may take us a little bit of time. Please, uh, you're welcome to come up and actually print on our press today. We brought these little coasters uh, for you all to print with a hand-carved linoleum block as a keepsake for the day. Uh, so you'll get to go home with one for free, no cost, right? Um, and then we'll talk more, and it's easier to do a hands-on demo, um, and I, we can explain a lot more at that point. So thank you very much. I appreciate you coming out today. Thank you.